Welcome to another edition of the Willie Bragg Show. I know, I know, it's 5.43 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I have not done an early morning stream like this in quite a while, but there's a reason I am doing it. Um, one, I was going to live stream last night, but I had a lot of quality sleep I had to catch up on, and I was hungry as hell, so I um, I went to, um, I went to, Denny's to have a late night dinner. I just got back and uh, and I had a little trouble. Uh, I would have actually put up a um, live stream earlier, but I was having trouble with the thumbnail. But I got that resolved. But y'all don't want to hear that, do y'all? <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, it is all good now. Thank you. Um, how are you doing, Miguel? Um, yeah, today is a special um, live stream, and the reason it is is we have an election uh, uh, coming up Tuesday. So, and um, and I'm going to do my live stream tonight. I have a live stream that I am going to do tonight. So this one's going to be a little bit longer than usual. So um, that's that's why I decided to do it at this hour so I can get some sleep. Um, so, with no further ado. We're going to discuss a couple of topics that relates to the 2024 election. And uh, the topics in, you know, basically involves, uh, it involves, uh, you know, um, Shank Ugert and Anna Kasparian, um, her comments about Trump and, and Shank Ugert exploding. Um, and not all as well at the Young Turks. So, these days, I think that they, I think that they're, they're about ready to be in the dustbins of uh, media history at this point. Um, and now we're going to discuss also uh, the the g- generics of the presidential election between Kamala Harris and and Donald Trump. Of course, um, you know, um, have to discuss the duopoly because the duopoly is happening, whether we like it or not. And we're also going to discuss the, um, connected to duopoly, the mean girl fight between uh, Lindsey Graham and um, Liz Cheney. 
And also, we're going to discuss, uh, finally, um, also related to 2024, uh, the European Green Party versus Jill Stein of the Green Party of the U.S. And, um, and what I have to say about this. So, with well, no further ado, we'll, we'll start with the first story. And, um, and this first, and this is what I have to say. Um, there's something about the Young Turks. Uh, um, and everybody in this space, pretty much, we're no, we're no, um, we're no stranger to the Young Turks. I, I'm going to sound like a broken record, I know, but um, the Young Turks, pretty much, is you know, most of us, most of us got started listening to the Young Turks. We we started watching the Young Turks, and we thought they were, we thought they were wonderful, and at one time they may have been. But uh, they've taken a, a turn to the center, and um, some people, uh, a lot of people left them, uh, some for the worse, some for the better, but people leave that network, and it's usually not under the best of terms. We're talking about Dave Rubin, who's worse than the Young Turks. He, he is in his Republican bubble. We're talking about Jimmy Dore, who left the Young Turks because he was too far left for the Young Turks, but they managed to try to call him right wing. But fingers are pointing at somebody else at the Young Turks currently as right wing or headed in that direction, seemingly, in the, in terms of grift. Um, some people got canned uh, by the Young Turks. You know, your Jordan Her uh, Sheraton, I, bel I believe he was canned from the Young Turks. I'm not sure. I know he left the Young Turks under bad terms, and he gripes about it. And I think, I think, I think, I think Kyle Kalinske was also canned by the Young Turks. So the Young Turks seems to have a kind of, they don't really have, and there's one guy that left the Young Turks, uh, I'm sorry, young uh, a lady, a trans woman that left the Young Turks because of Anna Kasparian's um, um, shenanigans and um, and her transphobia. So, um, so you you see, not all is well at the Young Turks right now. So, um, so we're going to start with them. Anna Kasparian um, started. Um, having conversations with Ben Shapiro. As much as I don't like Ben Shapiro, I I don't have a problem with her talking to Ben Shapiro. I don't have a problem with left-wing people and right-wing people having dialogues. I don't have a problem with that. I really don't. Uh, what I have a problem with is that the money on the right wing it gets flashed around a lot of people, and then all of a sudden, they start changing their ideology. And it's happened to quite a few people. Uh, and other people have been offered money and they have turned it down too. Um, so, uh, and, but th there's something that's been going on in the last few years. And, you know, it's not because the left are terrible or the left are evil and the left are just wrong. It's because the right wings got the money. They got the money. And they bribe people and and like it's a shiny new object and they go into a terrible direction. The very first prominent example was Dave Rubin. He went into that direction and he, he's actually the worst of them all. Uh, there are others out there. Tim Pool went into that direction. Karen Borisenko, I believe that's her name. She went into that direction. Ariel Scarcella went into that direction. Um... I believe Blair White went into that direction. Um, who else? Um, a couple of folks have went into that direction. Uh, Candace Owens went into that direction. They all came out of some kind of liberal left or progressive, what have you, uh, um, beginnings. And all of a sudden, they changed their politics overnight. Uh, others lately, like Russell Brand have changed his politics and and Tulsi Gabbard. Now, I have a little bit of empathy for Tulsi Gabbard because Tulsi Gabbard was pushed there by Hillary Clinton because uh, I, I a conservative Democrat pushed her to the right. Same thing with Robert F. Kennedy. They pushed 
him into the Trump camp. They push Tulsi Gabbard also into the Trump camp. I don't particularly like that they got pushed in there. I don't like the fact that they're pro-Trump, but they were pushed in there. And for them, I have maybe just an ounce of empathy, even though I despise what they became. So um, there is that. So um, the Vanguard, which I, I have my issues with the Vanguard in a lot of ways, but uh, I think that they've been getting a little bit better lately. They were they were getting kind of sorry for a while. And now they're getting a little bit better, um, although, you know, they had their moments. They were commenting on the civil war going on between Shank Uger and Anna Kasparian and the fact that Sam Cedar showed up on the Temple podcast and was giving his two cents. And Lord have mercy, I'm finding myself in agreement with Sam Cedar. And I, you know, I, I'm not particularly a strong Sam Cedar fan. Um, I have not really been a Sam Cedar cheerleader. <laughs> not that we should be cheerleaders for any of these folks, but I've not been a an avid, you know, oh Sam Cedar, you know, fan for for many years. Uh, not because I disagree with what I have to say. I I think that we all agree with most of these people on policies. It just um, some of their little shit libby. Um, aspects about them that kind of ruin what good they they could provide in their analysis and all of that so and i'm kind of mad at sam cedar because he when it came to force a vote he reluctantly decided well in spite of it being a jimmy door idea which it wasn't a jimmy door idea it was a dsa idea initially uh, but jimmy door brought it up he decided to go with it then he decided that he was against it and because he he does, I guess he must have thought that his hatred of Jimmy Dore was more important than having him Medicare for all. So there is that as well. So anyway, here are the Vanguard boys talking about um, Sam Cedar and Tim Poole talking about the feud going on between Anna Kasparian and Shank Uger and why she's leaving the left. Shank Uger and Anna Kasparian. The Fred Flintstone and Wilma Flintstone of the online left. Get it. So many former liberals are now leaving the left. Um, I mean, people switch parties and uh, ideologies. Not happening the other way around. Is that right? Yeah. Well, like I, Anarchist, like where's a big right wing pundit who joined the liberal network? Like Anna Kasparian announcing she's leaving the left. You know what I mean? Hunter Avalon, which uh, he's kind of a shit lib, but he became buddy buddy with uh, Bosch. Not really a very uh, positive example. I understand that, but he started off as some um, some scuzzy right wing hack, and he actually went into a more left leaning uh, direction, kind of in the uh, destiny direction, destiny Xander Hall Bosch sort of universe. Um, I guess that's better than being Ben Shapiro, but it's, you know, um, he's he's not all that uh, he's not all that really really all that impressive. And or Dave Rubin. I mean, listen, uh, I, I I if you want to money, say money, that money, these money. are like the intellectual pillars of no, uh, certainly not. I'm saying something things causing an emotional rift that makes people not want to be on the left anymore. Well, I I, I would suggest it's probably cash. Okay. I mean, like said, wanted money. I, she said as much as far as I know in the past on on DYT. She said she would make more money by being not leftist. I don't know if she said that. I, I mean, she didn't exactly say that. She at one time made it clear that she was jealous of Shank's uh, nephew, um, Hassan Piker, for being a gamer streamer making money, you know, so easily as a streamer, whereas she has to go and you know basically do her homework, you know, uh, as a journalist, um, executive producer for TYT and everything. And she, she kind of resents that, you know, um, and there is partly that, but, uh, you know, um, oh, well. I mean, I, but I know that, uh, on, on, on her show on TYT, they have, uh, she's complained about not making money. I don't know why she's, uh, she's still on TYT. Like, is, are they going to lose members who are progressives? I got to be honest with you. I don't really pay that much attention to, like, showbiz. 
Also, outside of her, why are there so many people? Liar, you pay attention to it, Sam. Because you, you, you talk about Jimmy Dore like there's no tomorrow. And a couple of times a week when when I used to watch a uh, majority report on 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 frequent occasions. I don't really watch majority report anymore, but when I did, you couldn't stop talking about Jimmy Dore. And and I, I think by 2021, 2022, I kind of just weeded off uh, of even watching it even on a part-time basis. Maybe once in a blue moon, I'll I'll see a headline or something. I'll I'll catch it and and what have you. But anyway, people like you have a meme from Colin Wright where it shows the left going all the way to the far left and liberals being like, "What's happening?" I don't know who Colin Wright is. Sure, uh, there's there's many prominent personalities who I used to be liberals and now identify as moderates or or disaffected liberals or post liberal. Um, like you're saying, like a substantial. Can I talk about in an election? Most charitable manner, right? It's easy and cavalier to say it's cash. And I think it all does boil down to that. But I also think one reason why you see people leave the left and run to the right, and you don't see too many people leave the right and run to the left, you might see them run to the mainstream Democratic Party, which is the new right, the Reagan right. But you're not going to see them run to the left, right? So I don't want to hear about Joe Scarborough being an example or Chris Christie being an example, right? What happens is, as you gain prominence as a left commentator, as a left media figure, right, we've talked about it, you gain the privilege of being an advocate instead of somebody who needs advocacy, right? You are no longer impacted in a material way by any of the things you're discussing. That's why Anna Kasparian stopped caring about anything tangible except for what immediately impacted her homeless people, crime, uh, trans women somehow invalidating her perception of womanhood you know the birthing person thinks he's very much and that's something i don't get about anna kasparian with the birthing person statement she doesn't have kids and she appears to be not interested in having kids which in my view anybody who decides not to have kids that's a pretty damn smart decision to make because world's overpopulated different story subject for another time but mm, what I'm trying to make is, who cares if there's a goofy term that's been used called birthing person or individual with a uterus or whatever that, that was being used, bonus hole? Who fucking cares? How does it affect her, honestly? How does it affect her, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, how does it affect her any more than than a straight dude like myself if two dudes down the street get married or shack up. Not one bit. You know, so yeah, I, I you know, I don't I don't understand how Anna Kasparian decided that being a turf is the way to go. I just don't uh, I don't get it. I don't get it. Mild, totally superfluous things, frankly, when you're talking about it from Anna Kasparian's perspective how they impact her life right like way more serious to think about how being unhoused impacts an unhoused person you know being a vulnerable you know mentally unwell person on the streets a lot harder than having to look at one right yeah about the uh, homelessness problem in california uh, you know there's a time that young turks would to talk about well the cure for homelessness is providing people a home but you know they're talking about you know using law and order now and, and shit like that I mean, uh, you know, if they're trying to appeal to normies, there's got to be an effective way to appeal to moderate normies than trying to borrow some of the conservative talking points. That's what the Democratic Party did in the 1990s with, with the DLC bullshit. This is like the online version of the left of this shit. And that's and Shank Ugert's borrowed on the schemes too, uh, not as overtly as Anna Kasparian, perhaps, but he's touched on those themes. And so what happens is as you get move further and further away from the issues that you're closest to, right? You run to the coast, you start hanging out with a bunch of rich people because you're rich. Now you want to go to nice restaurants, you want to have a Versace bag, and it makes you feel uncomfortable if you're hanging out with people who can't afford Versace bags. So you move yourself into a different social circle, and those people then rub off on you. And then you will start to indulge in your reactionary thoughts because you're not anchored to any kind of collectivism or solidarity and it moves yourself. And then that's all lubricated. That's all aided by the fact that you're now awash with 
cash and you're being celebrated by a new demographic, which always makes you feel good. Yep. Yep. Also, I mean, Sam Cedar is just 100% right. They do it for money. Yeah. Tim Pool knows that as well as any of these grifters. So he knows how phenomenally wealthy being a right wing commentator has made him. We just found out about the tinted media thing. How much money was he getting paid per video? Like $100,000? You, you, they're not offering that to left wingers and not offering that to left wing commentators. And also, yeah, Anna, over and over again on her own show, this isn't us, you know, reading her body language. No, she has said it multiple times. We have reacted to it multiple times. I don't make enough money. I want to make more money. I'm jealous of other people and other colleagues, That's other it. people who used to work at TYT, who left TYT and now make more money being right wing grifters, right? This is something she's identified. Go back and watch her videos where she talked about Dave Rubin leaving the left and she understood this at the time she talks about it in those videos she says yeah of course he's doing this because the left is not where the money is at the now with regard to uh her critique of day rubin i could see a jealousy factor considering how dumb day rubin is and and how much money he's made it, you know uh, being a a dumb right-wing grifter um that that uh that um uh prager cash in my view um probably got dangled in front of him you know i think that he's one of those folks with the deep pockets um in my view and um you know if it isn't dennis prager if somebody is somebody else they're dangling a lot of money in front of these people i understand that uh now i i'm not particularly keen on david pacman in the year 2024 uh, i yeah, but, uh, you know, and there are things that I do find wrong ideologically with David Pakman, but he's not gone to the other side um, and he's been offered cash because uh, he's, you know, he's he comes across as smart and um, and, you know, and intellectual and um, and, you know, and very um, and very well reasoned or what have you. And because of that, he's been offered cash, and he said that he's turned it down. Well, good for him. And there are things I have a problem with David Pakman. I have a problem with his duopoly bullshit, okay? I don't have a problem with him as a human being. Uh, he seems like a nice guy, but I have a problem with his, uh, with his um, duopoly positioning. Um, he, he wants to... He wants to fight the establishment in a polite way. He wants a job in MSNBC. That's what it comes down to, you know. Um, there, you know, there's a list of things that that, that I find objectionable about about uh, David Pakman. But thankfully, he's not going to become, you know, a right wing hack. Um, Kim Iverson, whose politics on the left is on a different area of the left from David Pakman. Uh, in her response, in her, in her, excuse me, in her situation, likewise, she was offered a lot of cash for what I understand. I think in a conversation, I think it was a conversation she had with Nico House years ago where she was talking about being offered cash to go to the right or something. And she also turned it down. Uh, some people think she is right wing. Um, I don't, uh, just like David Pakman, but for different reasons, I don't agree with Kim Iverson on some fundamental issues, but I, I respect her. And I think that what it is with Kim Iverson that people don't quite get is the fact that she has very libertarian tendencies that she's kind of a fuse in where her um, left progressive um, value system, and uh, and that kind of confuses a lot of people. And but I I understand it. Um, I understand it. I even have I even there's some, there are some major areas where I'm actually sympathetic to what she has to say. Some areas uh, she's a little out to lunch on too. But but I think that people are more harsh on her than they need to be. Um, than they, they need to be. And some people think she's right wing or whatever. She's made it clear. Unless she's changed her position, that she's she is supporting Jill Stein for president. So um, I don't think you're much of a right winger if that's where you're at, uh, in my view. But we'll we'll let we'll let uh, this video go on. The money's on the right. It's easy as hell to make 
make a shit ton of money being a brain dead, talentless right wing hack commentator. Tim Pool has no talent. Tim Pool's barely compelling to listen to. Same with. Yeah, you're right about that. <laughs> Seeing paint dry is more exciting than listening to Tim Pool. Dave Rubin, but they're way, way richer than people. Dave Rubin is dumb as a box of rocks. He's so dumb as a box of rocks that even, even Joe Rogan wouldn't have him back. And I've been kind of, I, I have my issues with Joe Rogan. In some ways, people beat up too much on Joe Rogan, but I have some issues with Joe Rogan too. Now, um, I also think that Joe Rogan's been pushed to the right in a lot of ways by um, some pious uh, liberals out there for some reason not liking him and trying to find fault in him. That they, I think that they would have left him alone. He could have been more uh, on a left-wing trajectory than where, where he's at right now. I mean, they pushed him into Alex Jones camp, like a soft Alex Jones uh, is where he's kind of at. And it didn't need to be that way. It really didn't need to be that way. The guy endorsed Bernie Sanders in t four years ago. Um, it didn't need to be that way. On the left, who are genuinely talented and who are actually compelling commentators even jimmy is probably richer than anna at this point oh, yeah. shows how low the bar is because he's utterly talentless but we can play the rest of this because i bet it gets better Elon Musk, mark zuckerberg not gonna call them why are billionaires becoming conservatives i didn't say they're becoming conservatives why are billionaires um who are previously supporting democrat politicians now aligning with well i, I would say i mean when you're talking about zuckerberg or elon musk i would say lena khan uh head of the ftc i would say a uh, John Cantor at the DOJ antitrust. Um, Why? So I think, I, I think I, I, money, agree with you, money, uh, money is I think, I think. threatened by any type of sort of uh, liberal stuff. Uh, but why did they support Democrats before? Why did they? Yeah. Well, because I think the Democrats went through a period of neoliberalism and I, 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 frankly I, ended. That. I'll, I mean, I'll give. Okay, well, there's I'll a ton of never Trumpers sure, sure. in the Republican Party. I, agree. I don't necessarily uh, want them to influence right. our policy. Uh, I'll completely agree with you on that. Uh, amen, Sam. I, I, you know, that's the problem with the Democratic Party today with them embracing Dick and uh, uh, Liz Cheney. You know, you have never Trumpers now kind of uh, uh, coming into the Democratic Party, and it's going to turn the Democratic Party into basically the Bush Cheney style Republican Party, but with a rainbow flag behind them. That's, you know, that's what's kind of happening right now. So, disagree with your assessment. You're just looking. It, right now, you're, you're right. Been an about about some type of measure of stuff. But you've got uh, you've got people like Eric Woman, for instance, who says the craziness primarily comes from the left. Well, you can Eric Woman. Um, hold on a second here. Let me do this for a moment. Yeah, uh, you can see what's going on. Uh, with 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 uh, you can see what's going on with the grifting, and um, you know, it's it's. You know, it people should see right through it. I mean, it was one thing to be Dave Rubin four or five years ago. It was different. It was different seeing um oh, it was different seeing people like Dave Rubin or Ariel Scarcella or somebody doing this or or Tim Pool at first or what have you. But when they are coming out of the woodwork doing this bullshit. And and you got you got people you got people on the you got people you got people on the um, the so the 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 conservative side gloating, and you got a gullible center out there listening to this. They're like, well, I guess there must be something to the left being toxic that they go to the right because I guess the right must be better, and the left needs to do a better job of trying to fight this and let the people know what a fucking griff is and uh, and and they need to do a better job uh it's not our fault that this is happening it's happening because there are people out there they're trying to destroy the destroy the movement so uh let's go ahead and continue all right internet and feeling like I'm no longer the, the young Turk, you know, in this instance, quite literally. And for the longest time, she was considered the leftiest lefty on YouTube. You know, uh, no one was a more um, lefty commentator than Anna Kasparian, right? But all of a sudden, 
Now there's younger, newer, and leftier channels out there. People like us and commentators like Olai Emil Lauren, who all of a sudden are saying things that Anna's like, well, I don't know if I'm comfortable with this. I don't know if I'm this progressive. I don't know if I'm this left wing. And all of a sudden that creates a dynamic where it's like, oh shit, I'm not the leftiest person anymore. Now I have this left flank that's calling me out or that's criticizing me. And what do you do in reaction to that? Well, if you're a cringy, bitter Karen, like Anna Kasparian, then you readjust your entire yeah. politics in a reactionary way. That's what we've seen happen. But again, this happens to people who are commentators and just normal folks as they get older. Oftentimes bitterness and simply being out of touch leads them towards the right way, right? Uh, the, the less you associate with young people after you've graduated school and you're kind of in your own bubble in your echo chamber, yeah, all of a sudden you're not getting exposed to new culture, to new ideas, to new ways of progressive thinking. And you do become stuck in your ways. And again, that oftentimes leads to a reactionary outlook where you think, oh, my generation was the last one to understand and society. My generation was the last one to understand a true vision of progressivism. And anything to the left of that is now a crazy, you know, this is just young Zoomers who want to take this off the cliff or something. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. And we actually have some breaking news, everybody. Let's take a look here. It looks like Jankyver saw the clip we just reacted Ooh. to and has come out swinging. At this point, Sam Cedar is just a gross liar. And I never said you want to leave a left for money. When he's pushed on it, he claims ignorance. Then why did you lie about it? We lost subscribers and money because we acted out of principle. Something Sam wouldn't understand. I ran for Congress. I busted a union. I ran a failed presidency for a uh, campaign for presidency, okay? He ran on it. Working to the ground, okay? And that's why my co-host is leaving. And that's why she's running to the right, okay? It ain't because of uh, anything else. This is so embarrassing. Holy shit. Thank you for finding this. That crazy stuff. So now, Jank has entered the ring. We have a full-on lefty civil war. Jank Uger versus Sam Cedar. Jank Uger and Anna Kasparian versus Sam Cedar. This, this is crazy, guys. This is crazy. And obviously, Jank is, you know, he's freaking out because he knows that Sam is 100% correct. And he, uh, can you go back to the preview real quick? Sorry. Um, yeah, so, you know, obviously Sam Cedar is correct, but he has to now perform this outrage and pretend to call out Sam Cedar and defend Anna Kasparian, even though oh, Sam is just saying what we all obviously know. Even Jenkins knows what's happening. You can see it in his body language. You can see it in the way he responds to Anna's BS talking points like we did earlier in the show. He knows what's going on. Um, but for whatever reason, instead of doing what needs to be done, he's going to keep defending her until she really, truly does take the whole network down with her. Anywhere you go, I'll follow you too. I'll follow follow you down. Wow, that's crazy, though. Yeah, anyway, we can uh, play the rest of this if we have anybody. Yeah, it uh, doesn't look like Jenks followed up at all. I was making sure he didn't reply to his own tweet. Oh, actually, he did. Finally, I was like, I want to make sure we get all that Jenks tweets in case he deletes anything. This is the dumbest point in the world. Uh, at this point, you are just a grifter asshat. He says, this is the dumbest point in the world. How is losing money out of principle of rip? This is exactly what we did in the Obama years, too. We lost a lot of subscribers because we criticized Obama from the left. We do these things because we care what's true. A novel concept. Yep. I love it when you criticize. Uh, <laughs> Trump from the left too. Like, ah, is he, is he fascist? I don't think. I don't even think he's a wannabe dictator. Half of your, you know, network, Jake, your co-host. Yeah, she's not a progressive. So you don't get to call yourself the home of progressives and then melt down when people criticize you for not being progressive. Rebrand and call yourself Jake and Anna Network. Call yourself the uh, the left. It's too left for me. Call yourself the fence sitting post. I don't care. Yeah, hundred percent. That's well. The thing about it is that. Um... Starting in 2016, when they had the Katzenberg money coming in, and Jeffrey Katzenberg is a Clinton donor, um, I started to notice the quality of the Young Turks uh, going downhill. Um, it started going downhill with RussiaGate and 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 Trump this and Trump that. And there are things to criticize Trump about. I want to make this clear. There are things that you can criticize Trump about. A million things you can criticize Trump about. Um, you know, but but going after him on Russia and things of that nature. Now, I mean, they're not as they're not as stupid about it as let's say CNN or MSNBC or whatever outlet out there that that don't that that will sit there and talk about Trump eating steak with a ke with ketchup or something along those lines. I mean, you know, that's that's ridiculous, you know. Or the, even the proverbial, oh, he plays golf too much. You know, I get so tired of hearing politicians, people, hacks out there accusing the president that they don't like. From George Herbert Walker Bush Sr. to, to Joe Biden today, if he plays golf. I don't even know if he plays golf or not. Don't care. Oh, they're too busy playing golf. You know, I remember when I was at work. Uh, about 10 years ago when Benjamin Netanyahu came to speak in joint session of Congress and somebody got on me about how Obama, as if I was an Obama supporter, uh, uh, Obama 
uh, would not go and meet Benjamin Antiago. He decided he would rather play golf. And I told this person, I said, hey, if if I had a choice between playing golf and and hobnobbing with Benjamin Antiago, give me golf any day. Honestly, why the hell would I want to hobnob with Benjamin Antiago? And um, anyway, um, it, yeah, that's beside the subject. But um, just just pointing that out. Um, but as I said, um, this this whole notion that, that, that this meltdown, the stupid meltdowns they were having. I mean, you know, um, you know, and I, I mean, honestly, I think that the Young Turks went too far nuts on the Trump derangement syndrome. And while I do not think that Jimmy Dore is a right wing grifter like others have claimed, I do think that he probably was a little bit light on the criticism of Trump than he needed to be. Although he has actually criticized Trump on some occasions. And, uh, so somebody had told me, oh, Jimmy Dore never criticizes Trump. He never criticizes the Republicans. No, there are plenty of videos you can watch where he's actually criticized. Well, he definitely criticized the Republicans. Um, but he's not, uh, you know, he, yeah, it's true that he could, he has not criticized Trump perhaps as much as he needs to. But, you know, um, again, I would, I would have to call bullshit on both teams on on that one but that's just my perspective you know um you know i'm and i've been accused i've been accused by right wingers of suffering from the most over the top style of trump derangement syndrome that that the libtards suffer from and i have been accused by people by shit libs and even some on the left who are in on that tds bandwagon of of having secret uh secretly um liking trump or something which you know you know trump is your standard republican president he's loud and more um bombastic um and it's funny sometimes so i mean so you got nothing got no choice other than to laugh at it because it's just like it is so it's so um just so not the usual what you expect from politicians who who sit there and tone police. And so it comes across as funny sometimes. I mean, some serious shit, but it, it comes across as funny. But, um, but as I said, the TYT, they, they went into this real meltdown that I felt like y'all needed to be more concerned about getting Bernie Sanders the nomination in 2020 than to be concerned about this this uh, Trump derangement syndrome bullshit, you know, um, that, you know, that I just kind of felt that way, you know, uh, but that, that was my perspective at the time. Not that I'm defending Bernie Sanders today, but I'm just, I'm talking about from, from the perspective of back then. So uh, we'll let these guys continue. That's crazy again. Cause you're a failed grifter. Cause Sanders is a failed grifter. She's not good at doing what she's trying to do, but guess what? She's, Still going to become phenomenally wealthy. Not not so much you, Jink. Uh, TYT is not going to ultimately be the one who benefits financially from what Anna Kasparian is doing. Anna Kasparian is going to be the one who benefits. You're just too stupid to see it right now, and you still think you can somehow turn this into a W for your own network, which is a real delusional thing about this. Jink, Anna is leaving you. She's leaving TYT. The marriage is ended, bro. She's already contacted a divorce lawyer. Yep, yep. Uh, and Shank Uger is the Fred Flintstone on the online left. And she's the Wilma of the online left. And her lawyer is Ben Shapiro, her divorce lawyer. You're still out here defending her wretched behavior? You're still out here defending the indefensible and gaslighting everyone, including totally reasonable people like Sam Cedar? This is absolutely outrageous, Jake. You have, have to rip the band-aid off at some point. You have to realize that you cannot go down with her. You I don't know about Sam Cedar being re uh, reasonable. He may have been reasonable in his dialogue with... Uh, Tim Pool, but I don't know if he's reasonable as a general rule, um, because uh, you know he's got some uh, he's got some uh, odious uh, views when it comes to how to uh, forward the progressive movement, and it's not worked. But anyway, 
You cannot save yourself. Save DYT. There's still time. What is this? That's enough of that. So that's uh, that was from the Vanguard. And as I said, um, you know, um, Anna Kasparian, um, probably in the next, you know, four or five years, will she become the next day Rubin? Or will she become Day Rubin Light, meaning that she's not going to be a Republican hack, um, you know, um, sucking Trump's cock if, if Trump becomes president, or 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 basically just becoming uh, the next um, Ann Coulter type, or what have you? Uh, will she be? Will she be more uh, like? Uh, will she be more like uh, uh, Bill Maher? Um, like a, a, a normie Democrat say, thinking, well, the left is just too crazy, you know, uh, asking for woke things like Medicare for all and, and uh, getting us out of these neocon wars and, and, and just, uh, and, you know, asking for, for uh, a minimum wage increase, uh, demanding it. How dare they, you know, would she be calling that woke? Because that's exactly what uh, Bill Maher tends to do. You know, and uh, so um, whether she's headed in the direction of Dave Rubin or Bill Maher, it's not a good direction either way, but she's headed in that direction. So um, and my question is this, the Vanguard, excuse me, Anna Kasparian said that Jimmy Dore is turning right wing. The Vanguard says Anna Kasparian is turning right wing. So. If it's true that Jimmy Dore is turning right wing, and if it's true that Anna Kasparian is turning right wing, and my personal sentiment is that Jimmy Dore is not turning right wing. I don't agree with him on everything, but he's not turning right wing. But if it's if he is turning right wing and Anna Kasparian is turning right wing, in that scenario, do they make up and kiss up and become friends again like is the year 2015? 2014, 2015, and, you know, like it's, like they were back in the days of the Young Turks, but they're in the right-wing camp now. Is that how it works? Is that how it will work? Are they going to are they gonna be on each other's show uh, when she ultimately leaves the Young Turks? Um, how How is this going to work, you know? Is she going to hobnob with, with Alex Jones, you know? Is she going to do this? I mean, we... We want to know one way or the other. Um, so anyway, let's go with the next story. And um, as you know, it's been driving me crazy about what about the Democrats, you know, because here's the thing. It's the 2024 election. With this 2024 election, it's like a repeat of 2016, except there's no talk of that menacing Medicare for all that the that the um, that the um, right wing are so scared of and the and the shit libs and the corporate Democrats wish oh my God would that issue just go away they got their wish it went away you're not hearing them talk about you're not hearing talk about Medicare for all anymore you're not hearing you're not even hearing talk about the the Protect the Right to Organize Act. You're not hearing any of this talk at economic populism that you were hearing uh, several years ago. And it's so frustrating. We're back to the days where the Democratic Party was neoliberal. People can sit there and tell me how far to the left that the Democratic Party is. But is the Democratic Party far left when they're sitting there um you know, licking the asshole of, of Dick Cheney and Liz Cheney? Are they, is that left wing? Um, it was a time when Dick Cheney was viewed as Trump before Trump, according to Glenn Green, those are Glenn Greenwald's work. Trump before Trump. That's an accurate, that's an accurate uh, way to look at it. We hated Dick Cheney. I remember this. It was whether you were a corporate Democrat or whether you were a left-wing Democrat, whatever, whether you were uh, the Green Party, whether you were an uh, independent uh, person that was with left-wing politics, it was kind of agreed. You looked at Dick Cheney, and you were just like, what a piece of fucking shit he is. And we hated the guy. 
We it, we all had that in common. We look at that motherfucker who was the toast of Rush Limbaugh at that time. And, you know, um, a war criminal, a, a corporatist, you know, just an all-around asshole. He endorsed Kamala Harris. And, and, and Kamala Harris is bragging about it. You know, the Liz Cheney endorsement, the Dick Cheney endorsement. War criminals that they are. War criminals. You remember that photo op in 2018, I think it was, where George W. Bush is being hugged by Michelle Obama? And again, I'm quoting, I'm paraphrasing Jimmy Dore, where he says that, that liberals used to hate Ralph Nader because he supposedly gave us Bush, but now that the Democrats and the liberals are okay with Bush, they somehow still hate Ralph Nader. Let me update that. Let me update it for you. Um, when Hillary Clinton ran for president in 2016, the Democrats hated Bernie Sanders. Now that Dick Cheney has been embraced by the Democrats, Liz Cheney's been embraced by the Democrats, they still hate Bernie Sanders, the Democrats. See where I'm going with this? So, um, and again, I know some of y'all are mad at Bernie Sanders and it's all justified. The anger is justified. But I'm using Bernie Sanders as an example because Bernie Sanders is still kind of viewed as the man on the left that's the punching bag in the mainstream political world. When Roe versus Wade was overturned, instead of saying, well, it was because it was because we didn't codify Roe versus Wade. No, they didn't say that. They said it was Bernie Sanders. It was the Bernie bros that caused Hillary Clinton to win the election. That's what they said. Uh, it was shit like that. And and um, so you know, um, oh look at listen to Bernie Sanders uh, um, with his anti-establishment talk, just like Trump. No, they're not alike, but that's how they were trying to do this sort of thing back then. And now they're sitting there embracing Dick and Liz Cheney. No talk of a public option coming from Kamala Harris. You don't even hear anything from Tim Waltz about that issue. Um, you, know, you would think that Tim Waltz would be talking about it, but nothing is being talked about it. They're not talking about these things. This is this is the Democrats going back to the garbage. That they, that, I mean, they, you know, they you know the, the garbage that was trying to be that they were trying to clean up that garbage. The the there was a movement to try to clean up the garbage inside the Democratic Party. The garbage is still there. It's still there. The Clinton control of the party, they have won. They still control everything. And so the Democratic Party, I'm sorry, the Democratic Party cannot be rehabilitated, cannot be reformed. When you're embracing Dick and Liz Cheney, if that's not a sign that the Democratic Party can be reformed, I don't know what, what it will take. Because if you're willing to go and and you have a party that still hates Bernie Sanders, but they're just bragging about Dick and Liz Cheney. That's a party that's just going to go for the right. Along with the, as the Republicans go into fascism, the Democrats go into Reagan Bush territory. They've been into Reagan and Bush one territory for many years. Now they're about ready to enter Bush Cheney territory. And that's, where we're at. The Overton window just inches further and further to the right. But you got some mean girls. They're angry with each other. Liz Cheney and Senator Lindsey Graham. These two high school mean girls are angry with each other. So I do not know who uh, this person is. Let me go get the link out. His name is Jack Cochirella, 
and I'm butchering the hell out of his name. He's actually kind of boring, so it doesn't matter. But it the only thing that was interesting is the um, the cat fight, the the girl fight between uh, Lindsey Graham and Liz Liz Cheney. So um, Lindsey Graham melts down over Liz Cheney, and frankly, when Lindsey Graham is angry, I'm happy. Because anything that can piss him off makes me happy. So let's go ahead and listen to this video, and we will um, we will uh, discuss in just a moment. Let me get the speed. At, let me put it on one point two five, and let's go. Republicans are still trying to do everything they can to cover up for insane watch the threat that Donald Trump. Made against Liz Cheney's life the other night at an interview with Tucker Carlson in Arizona. And one Republican who went out of his way to try to do this, maybe the most dishonest of them all, was Lindsey Graham, who appeared on Fox in a state of desperation and was swearing at Liz Cheney because he is so upset with her and so upset with the state of the race. Lindsey Graham was crumbling in his appearance on Fox. It was an absolute nightmare for him and for Donald Trump. But we're going to get into all of that. But before we do, if I could quickly ask you to leave a like on this video. And if you haven't already, do you want support our channel to hit that subscribe button it goes a long way and it really means the world to me now before we get into lindsey graham's meltdown i want to see jay tapper shut down a different mega senator's defense of this disgusting attack on Liz Cheney in this clip right here what are you doing anna um let me say this let me say this it is not a disgusting attack on this cheney um there's nothing disgusting about verbally attacking Liz Cheney. Um, because Liz Cheney is an evil individual. She's evil. She's fucking evil. I just want to go and make that clear. So anyway, let's go ahead and I just want to make that clear. We'll get back to what we need to talk about. Okay. I mean, we've seen Mr. Trump's campaign in putting out press releases trying to clarify what he said. Mr. Trump put out a true social statement. He just said something about this. Obviously, whether or not everybody hears the message. And, you know, we ran the clip. We ran the whole clip. And we're not saying he's calling for her to be assassinated or killed. Uh, I think the issue is the very violent imagery at a time when Republicans are saying, oh, Democrats need to tone down Are you? Uh, he didn't say she should be executed. Uh I mean, he did not say that, honestly. He really did not say that. I'm not defending Trump. I don't have any plans to vote for him. But honestly, if you listen to what he said, he did not say that. He did not say that. I'm worried at all politically that, you know, this is going to be decided by a handful of voters and a handful of states that this could hurt. Let me just say this, Jake, more serious. War is deadly. He was making that point with this, this, this analogy. I think that's what's here. That's the point here. What we're talking about, though, is the fact that President Trump is actually winning. Voters would much prefer to hear about what Kamala Harris's position is on the economy, what she's going to do to fix our broken southern border, to take crime in our streets down, to make our nation more safe and secure. Rather than talk about that, we're going to blow up yet another one of these stories into some sort of free election day hoax. I think we should move on. I don't know how you define hoax. This is not a hoax. We ran this clip, and you know, there are people who are legitimately offended by that. It's a distortion, Jake. This is a I ran the entire Oh, Senator, we ran the entire thing. I, I, and I have not sourced about violence. And the violence he's talking about is the violence that perpetrated on our men and women in service and the decisions that are made by people like Liz Cheney to send them into the pros. Liz Cheney was an assistant secretary of state. When did she send anyone in the mail? She was an assistant secretary of state during the Bush Cheney years. So she has her hand involved with war crimes. You ought to know that. I think President Trump is making a broad statement using her as an example of the war in Washington that make these decisions from the comfort of an office, perhaps not taking into account the fact that there are very serious consequences. Those consequences are realized by those people that are in the box, or those people that are actually in combat situations. That's what he was illustrating. So, so you think that anyone that takes issue with him invoking, let's put her with a rifle standing there with nine barrels shooting at her when the guns aren't trained on her face, you think anyone that takes issue with that is either perpetrating or falling victim to a hoax? No okay. Um... If you're given a rifle, that's not an execution. If somebody's being, sh if you're being shot at, I mean, he he's talking about her in a battlefield situation. 
that's what he's talking about. He's talking about her being combat ready for, for battle. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about having her executed. It would be pretty stupid to, to put somebody facing a firing squad and giving them a gun. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? There are so many things you could go and attack Trump policy-wise on, and you're going to go and take these words and manipulate it around. And he uses violent rhetoric. But I wouldn't say that in that context, I would not interpret it as violent. He's basically saying that she's a war hawk. Now, Trump is not that great on foreign policy. You're not exactly a peacenik when you're going around assassinating um, an Iranian general like Qasem Salanami with that drone strike, I believe, in January 2020, or toppling the gut what was it, the, the government, uh, the government of Evo Morales in Bolivia um, with the oh, can I, what's her name, Janine? I, I uh, I forgot her name. The, the she wanted to be a dictator. I cannot. Ah, gosh, I would have been. I would have been able to remember her name about a minute ago. The one that looks like a porn star. Um. Yeah, you, you had the what was this thing? Uh, you had the um, Juan Guaido, who was appointed president of Venezuela by Donald Trump. What authority does he have to declare somebody a president that was not voted for as president? You know? So, you know, um, and they're trying to topple the government of Venezuela. That's not being a peacenik. Trump is not being a peacenik. But is he correct to go after Liz Cheney and her dad? Absolutely. Absolutely he's correct to go after them. He has my blessing to go after them. He's absolute. I, I mean, on that one, I'm with him. I'm I'm 200% with him on going after Liz Cheney as far as the criticism is concerned. And no, I do not want, I do not want her to be harmed or anything. I just want her and her dad to be arrested and put in prison for crimes against humanity. That's, that's all I want. That's all I want. You know, that's nothing crazy. Nothing, you know, I mean, I don't even favor torture. I'm against torture. But I, I favor prison for them. No one can legitimately say, what is this? Is this torture at a time? What's a distortion? I read that. I mean, no, this is a distortion. What's, this, this is a distortion. What President Trump meant, and you know, President Trump wasn't going for you know, any type of violence on this chain. Any, I didn't say what he was talking about. Was to consider, to consider the, uh, yes, that's what you were saying. You were saying that. Violence that anybody that we put into that circumstance might face. It's as simple as that. We need to get back to talking about the fact that President Trump is the only person that's on the ballot that can actually fix the damage that Kamala Harris and Joe Biden have done over the past four years. Uh, the damages that was done by Kamala Harris and Joe Biden was also done by Donald Trump, and and um, Mike Pence was also done by Barack Obama and George W. Bush and Bill Clinton and the first George Bush and Ronald Reagan and on and on and on. Because none of you motherfuckers who are just anti suit and ties in Washington, D.C. have the answers to what needs to, to, to help the American people. And all of this talking can paint for like Kamala Harris about what she's going to do, which she hasn't done. President Trump already has. People are asking themselves this basic question. Am I better off today under Kamala Harris than I was President, President Trump? That's so, why I'm moving the polls That's why. Honestly, when I hear, are you better off? Are you better off? Um, you know what? I, I'll say this. I'm just as well off as I was in the late 1990s. I mean, I'm not poor. I'm not wealthy. I'm, I'm, I am what you would call middle class. Um, and any improvement that has been made financially in my life has nothing to do with who's occupying the White House. Because there are things that you do in your day-to-day -day life that, that an act of Congress or an act of the presidency doesn't affect. I'm talking about economic decisions, economic planning, that sort of thing. It's not that you elect somebody and the moment they're sworn in, just like you waving a magic wand, things are better or things are worse. It doesn't work that way. 
it's such a simple mindset. It, it, it's, sim- it's, it's Neanderthal, simple-minded, partisan thinking. Things don't magically get better or worse because the guy you like or dislike is in the Oval Office or the party that you like or dislike are the majority in Congress at the moment. It doesn't work that way. So you know, that's what I heard from Democrats the other day when we were playing how Joe Biden called Trump supporters garbage. I got the same response. Back that this is all nonsense, it's a distraction, we're not, not covering the real issues. You know, it's the closest days of the campaign, and people say stupid things, they're gonna cover it. But you didn't say it, Senator. So I hope you come back and, uh, and we can talk about some substance issues after, no, for me. after the election. It's good to see you, and, and uh, the important issues. Uh, God bless on that. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. As the nation comes up on the final days of early voting, we're talking. They are really doing everything they possibly can to try to say wash Donald Trump, to try to make excuses, to try to pit this on Liz Cheney. What did Liz Cheney's worse than Donald Trump. That's what you don't understand. That's what you don't understand. And Liz Cheney voted with Donald Trump majority of the time. He was one of those Republican members of Congress that voted with Trump the majority of the time, like uh, like 93% of the time. And you're defending Liz Cheney? Even on the culture war bullshit, Liz Cheney is much closer to Marjorie Taylor Greene on LBGTQ rights, for example, than Donald Trump. Donald Trump is closer to a standard Democrat on LBGTQ rights than Liz Cheney is. And you're acting like he's Satan incarnate, and you're acting like Liz Cheney is, is, you know, this wonderful, benevolent figure. And my understanding is that the candidate that replaced her in Wyoming it's, has a more moderate voting record, even though she's a Trump bootlicker, she has a more moderate voting record than than Liz Cheney. Did she do wrong? I can't even come up with some argument that they're trying to make sure it is just utter nonsense. And you can see how nonsensical and dishonest Lindsey Graham trying to flip this on Liz Cheney is trying to say that she abandoned the conservative movement because she wants to conserve Democracy? That seems pretty... Liz Cheney wants to conserve democracy? Um, you know what a neocon is? A neocon is somebody who claims that they're pro-Western democracy as they go and crush democracies abroad. Be in line with what you would want to do, not just abandon all your values like you have, Lindsay. Spy must individual. But we don't need to hear my thoughts on Lindsay. We want to see a meltdown. If you the- you know, I remember for a brief moment when Lizzie Graham was all on the anti-Trump bandwagon in 2016. I, I remember that very well. And it was funny seeing him have his little meltdowns. Uh, in fact, I was I was so humored by it. I, I, I mean, and and then he ended up becoming the most obnoxious bootlicker. Um, he became the most obnoxious bootlicker uh, on when it came to Trump. And I guess when his, uh, I guess when he, you know he was no longer John McCain's bitch. When um, when uh, John McCain died, he I guess he had to. I guess he decided to become Donald Trump's new bitch. So um, you know, it is what it is. And um, but anytime he has a meltdown, anytime he's angry, I'm talking about Lindsey Graham, I'm all for it. I take delight in his anger, his mental anguish, his stress, his mental suffering. Here, my thoughts on Lindsey. We want to see a meltdown. Let's check out this clip right here. Liz Cheney, she's selling out conservatism to stay relevant. She got waxed in Wyoming, got defeated like, like, a, uh, like a drum, beat like a drum. And she's campaigning with Kamala Harris. You're telling me you're pro-life and you want this lady to be president? Are you pro-life, Lindsey Graham, when you support uh, the blowing up of babies in Gaza? Who believes in abortion up to the moment of birth? Don't ever talk to me about pro-life and abortion. All you evangelicals who sit there and suck Benjamin Netanyahu's dick 
and celebrate the the slaughter in Gaza and seeing babies getting blown up as if little babies are going to grow up to uh, as if little babies are terrorists or something. There's no pro life with, with you people. Tell me, you believe in a strong military when she advocated getting out of uh, Afghanistan, the last person in the room with Biden? You're telling me you Yeah, we needed to get out of Afghanistan. Um, and Lindsay, I want you to know this about Afghanistan. Uh, not only did the U.S. need to get out of Afghanistan, back in the 1980s, the Soviets needed to win in Afghanistan. And you know what would have happened if the Soviets would have won in Afghanistan? Maybe we would not have ever had 9-11. Believe in energy independence, and you want her to be president stopping oil and gas drilling? So Liz Cheney, don't listen to her. She's selling out conservatism to stay relevant. She's not relevant in, in terms of uh, of conservatism. She no longer has a voice. And you, Liz, uh, Lindsey Graham, you and Liz Cheney are ideologically the same. You are ideologically so similar. You're you're the same person politically. As to as to the Senate, they're trying to destroy Tim Sheehy now, who's leading in Montana, a certified war hero, uh, Navy SEAL, wounded, Purple Heart, a uh, bronze star with valor. They're accusing him of lying about his military record, but a racist tightening. Please send money through my website, lindsaygram.com. All the money goes to Tim Sheehy to be the 51st senator from uh, to get us back to the Senate. He's from Montana. They're trying to destroy him like they did Kevin. Now, help me help Tim Sheehy get us the Republican majority. Tell every friend you got it. You don't have a friend, don't make one. To get him out to the polls. Here's the good news. Kavanaugh won. Trump's going to win. We're going to win the Senate. We're going to push through all this bullshit. And I'm not going to listen to anything she has to say. Liz Cheney, uh, we're not garbage as uh, Trump supporters. And women who support Trump are not dumb garbage. So all I can say folks... No, I think you're dumb garbage, Lindsay. I think you're dumb garbage. This is the election of a lifetime. Liz Cheney is campaigning for Democrats to take back the House. She endorsed Mike Rogers' opponent in Michigan. She endorsed the Democrat to help Democrats take back the Senate. Don't listen to words she says. So as you can see, Lindsey Graham says that he's not going to put up with any of Liz Cheney's bullshit, and he's not going to have to deal with it. He's going to push through it. He was just kind of desperate, begging for donations to make sure that Republicans can try to flip the Senate. Something we absolutely cannot allow. Alex, you can just... <laughs> anyway, um, Liz, I mean, excuse me, Liz and Lindsay, as far as I'm concerned, that's that's about, that. they're pretty much the same as far as I'm concerned. So, um, you know, just, just watching, just watching him with his meltdowns just, uh, as I said, makes my day. Uh, so let's go with the next topic. And the next topic is uh, third parties in the presidential election, a, a certain third party presidential candidate. And that and this is from Politico. So um, and, um, and I will follow up with a video. Um, uh, Politico, um, this is from. Uh, um, hold on. Let's see. Do we have everything set up here? Do we? Do we? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, right now we have here um, Europe screens ask Jill Stein to pull out of U.S. election to prevent Trump victory. Can you believe that? Quote, quote unquote. The race for the White House is too close for comfort. Writes parties from around Europe calling on Stein to throw her support behind Democrat Kamala Harris. I, I, you know, what What can I say about this? You know, the, you know, the, I, I have a conspiracy theory I'm going to share with y'all if I can remember it after this. Green politicians from across Europe on Friday call on U.S. Green Party presidential candidate Jill Stein to withdraw from the race for the White House and endorse Democrat Kamala Harris instead. Quote, we are clear that Kamala Harris is the only candidate who can block Donald Trump and his anti-democratic authoritarian policies from the White House, unquote. Green parties from across the countries, from countries from uh, including Germany, 
France, Denmark, Italy, the Netherlands, Ireland, Estonia, Belgium, Spain, Poland, and Ukraine said in a statement which was shared with Politico uh, ahead of publication. Stein is on the ballot in almost every critical U.S. state polls between 1.1% and 1.4%, meaning her candidacy could cost Harris critical vote in tight race in the tight race for the White House. Right now, the race for the White House is too close for comfort, quote unquote. The statement said, quote, we call on Jill Stein to withdraw from the race and endorse Kamala Harris for the presidency of the United States, unquote. But with the election just days away, voters had head to the polls on November 5th and the relationship between Europe's Greens and Stein's party strain, the police seems unlikely to sway her. Quote, we are committed to this campaign for the presidency, and we would never betray our uh, legions of supporters. And the many supporters who have already cast votes by abandoning our mission now, regardless of which anti-democratic person or group makes the suggestion, unquote. Stein's team uh, said in a statement, quote, grassroots democracy is at the core of the green movement worldwide. And for, for one group of greens to tell another to stop participating in, democ in democracy is disappointing and unprincipled, unquote. Friday's statement from the European Greens highlighted the divergent values and policies, quote unquote, of the, of the European and, and U.S. Greens, noting, Quote, there is no link between the two uh, as the U.S. Greens are no longer a member of the Global Organization of Green Parties, unquote. That I did not know. A um, little statement here. Um, when I was in the Socialist Party, I was surprised uh, when we were not members of the Socialist International either. But, uh, but uh, I found out as to why later on. Um, the statement attributes to uh, Fisher. Uh, um, quote unquote, to the American Party's uh, relationship with parties with authoritarian leaders and serious policy differences on key issues, including Russia's full sell, uh, scale assault on the Ukraine. Unquote. Stein was criticized for attending a 2015 dinner in Moscow sponsored by Russian state television network RT, where she sat at the same table as President Vladimir Putin. In this, in this statement, uh, the Stein team dismissed the criticism as a quote-unquote smear, pointing that the Green Party's uh, Twitter post on the matter a year ago. Yeah, I, I, you know, the, the, the very notion that, that uh, they're trying to go and, and do the, the whole, um, you know, Russia smear. Uh, with Jill Stein, they did that with Tulsi Gabbard. They did that with. They even tried doing that uh, to Bernie Sanders, and you know anybody who's not part of the establishment, they get to be uh, smeared as a as a Russian asset. That's how it works. That's how it works. Um, well, Nico House has something to say about this, and I'll go ahead and share that video uh, momentarily. Okay. And are we ready for that video? Are we ready? Yes, we are. Finally, the European Greens have made the endorsement, and I just know they're about to endorse Jill Stein. And they actually tell Jill Stein instead they're not endorse Kamala Harris. Okay. As for this gentlemen, instead of endorsing Jill Stein, the actual Green Party candidate, the European Greens decided to endorse Kamala Harris because she's the only one who can block Donald Trump from reaching the White House. And of course they hit you with that same line, this is the most important election of our lifetime. Like that's supposed to matter. Because the choice is Trump and a possible continuation of genocide and Kamala, a guaranteed continuation of genocide. So maybe it is the most important election of our lifetime. But not for the reasons that they're talking about. But look at how they go into detail this endorsement. The Green Party family is made up of Green parties across Europe and advocates for politics that prioritizes the planet, people in peace above corporate greed, systemic injustice, and violence. So y'all wrote all of that, and your conclusion was, Jill Stein, you should drop out and endorse the candidate that represents 
represents the exact opposite of everything our party supposedly stands for with friendly the European Green Party, who need Democrats. And some of you might be thinking, or assuming, that the European Green Party would be avidly against genocide, so how could they even think about endorsing Kamala Harris? Yeah, unfortunately, you would be mistaken. If they are not as clear on their anti-genocide stand as you would think they are as compared to the Green Party of the United States. They're all about reaffirming Israel's right to exist before we even open up any discussion about the hundreds of thousands of lives ended by Israel and Gaza. In fact, if you go read their entire platform regarding Gaza, it looks as if Kamala wrote it herself. During this election alone, the Democratic Party has spent an inordinate amount of time, energy, and effort trying to do things like, like keep the Green Party off ballots in certain states, literally steal their federal funding so that they can't campaign effectively. Keep them off the debate stage. And that's just some of the things that they've done to the Green Party and Jill Stein in this election. Not to speak of about the last four to eight years. And all, all that time, the European Greens had nothing to say about the literal fascists, about the actual attacks on our democracy by suppressing a party from being heard so that people know what their options are when it comes to November 5th, 2024 presidential election. Now since Kamala can't get her shit together, since Muslim and Arab voters are leading the Democratic Party in droves to specifically vote for Jill Stein and Butch Webber. Now the European Green Party finally want to come out and comment in our election. And it's to tell the Green Party member to drop out of the election instead of congratulating her for offering a viable substitute, a viable option for voters who have, I don't know, fucking soul. They refuse to continue a genocide with their vote. Continue to fund the military industrial complex unapologetically and without accountability with their votes. Look, I know our Green Party ain't perfect, but damn. At least our Green Party isn't openly advocating the vote for genocide, but that just lets you know something. Jill Stein is doing so well that Green Parties from across the world have been called on to try and take her down. The UK Labour Party, who would normally be advocating on behalf of a candidate like Jill Stein, is showing up to North Carolina to campaign on behalf of Kamala Harris. The Democrats even ran and add for the very first time against the Green Party candidate when they ran one recently against Jill Stein. It looks like much of this should bring in the disbelief of Democrats. Genocide actually is a red line for much of the country. Thank God. Because I was starting to get a little bit worried, y'all. I really was. Yep, that was Nico House, and um, you know, um, always something valid to say, and uh, and all that, and uh, agree with him. Uh, uh, you know about uh, the European Greens. You know what the fuck is wrong with them that that they're going to go and um, encourage uh, Kamala Harris to drop out. I mean, this is this is ridiculous. Um, this is not what you're supposed to do. Um, it, not at all. Uh, you know, you're supposed to support your own, you know. Um, and um, think about it this I, I think that you know, there's a lot of talk about the deep state, and maybe our deep state is infiltrating the European Greens to do this sort of bullshit to, to destroy our two, uh, to destroy the a third party movement in the U.S. here with this statement. This is their way of doing this. Uh, one of the many ways. So, you know, in, uh, domestically, you have the Democratic Party doing what they can to keep the Green Party off the ballots, and and, uh, and uh, you know, hell, I mean, they 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 won't even allow an open primary anymore. So, um, you know, this you know if this sort of thing keeps coming up with the Democrats. They're going to Im self implode at this point. You know, a bunch of authoritarian centrists. Um, that don't stand for anything other than being authoritarian for the sake of being authoritarian, people are going to look elsewhere. Um, and the Republican Party could benefit from this, even though the Republican Party has their their uh, set of authoritarian uh, principles themselves. But yeah, the Democrats running a campaign commercial against uh, 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 Jill Stein you remember in the 2020 primaries when Michael Bloomberg ran one commercial? It wasn't to attack Donald Trump. It was to attack Bernie Sanders, Bernie bros. 
And now the Democratic Party took that with them, and they didn't go around attacking Donald Trump. They went to attack Jill Stein. I can guarantee you, ideologically, the Democratic Party has a bigger problem with Jill Stein than they do with Donald Trump. In fact, I just about promise you that's the case. Because, uh, you know, where's the talk uh, of a uh, of, of Medicare for All or a public option? Where's the talk of the Protect the Right to Organize Act? Where's the talk of taking on the military industrial complex? Where's the talk of, of um, you know, accountability of, of banking and, and insurance institutions? Where's the talk about this? Nowhere to be seen. Nowhere to be seen at all. And um, so I wanted to go and discuss this here um, kind of early in the morning. Because uh, uh, my live streams are usually about an, uh, an hour more or less in the evenings when I do it Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. But I, I decided to do this. And plus, uh, tomorrow, we're having a, a special Braglands, which is the election night coverage. So um, I decided to do my own stories here and, um, and comment on it. So, you know, there is that. And uh, so, um, anyway, uh, let's go and talk on the chat line here and see how everybody's doing. Okay. And as I said, I remember Miguel earlier. Miguel, uh, uh, again, once again, I hope you're well. Uh, we have here, um, we have here, um, scrolling on down, Earl Kosak. Well, they're left-wing hacks, so uh, referring to the Young Turks. I have no idea who you are, Earl, but uh, um, Young Turks are hacks. I don't know how far left they are anymore at this point. So, And Dennis Hill says here, uh, Lucer Trump, or Dennis Hell. And then uh, Dr. Nick Riviera says, hi, everyone, and hello right back to you, sir. So, um here we are uh, at the uh, end of the line right here. So, as I said, if you haven't voted already yet, you know, you got today the early vote in if, if it's accessible for you to do so, please do so. Um, and, of course, tomorrow's election day. If you haven't voted yet, you know, please uh, make the effort. And vote your conscience. I don't vote shame. You know where I stand when it comes to electoral politics. I am very try to I try to stay independent as far as the duopoly, but I don't vote I don't do the voter shame thing. So, you know, um I you know I I understand that people have their points of view on these matters and um and so do I. So um and we'll see what happens. A special announcement tomorrow night at um, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. At 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, 4 o'clock Standard Time, we're going to have uh, Braglands on. And um, just, I'm sorry, I'm burping. <sighs> I'm sorry, I, I just ate something a little earlier. So we're gonna have Brag Lance on and we'll see. Um we'll we'll have uh we'll have um Bill Stodden, William Stodden and Stephanie Shalinsky from the Socialist Party USA. They are the Socialist Party USA candidate for president. And um and let me get everything set up over here so you can see the thumbnail and all that. And uh, and let me go and have everything set up because I don't have a producer. I'm, I am my own producer, as you know. So there we go. And as you can see, um, or you can, oh yeah, you can see it. There, there it is. Um, the Willie Bragg, um, excuse me, Braglands. 2024 election coverage, uh, president and vice president of the Socialist Party USA, uh, William Stodden and Stephanie Shalinsky. And um, they'll be joining us and we'll be discussing their campaign. We'll be discussing the campaign of other third parties, the campaign of the duopoly. We'll be discussing the politics in general and reacting to the election results pretty much. Uh, 
and all that. So it sounds like a lot of fun. So I I hope that every one of y'all will come in and join us and and, and all of that. So um, and I've known I've known um, uh, William and and Stephanie for years. So it'd be nice to to um, to talk to them. You know, in person. Uh, once again, other than, uh, than, you know, through the Facebook and all that. So, um, so let me just, uh, finish with my final words here. And if you like what you heard, please press like and comment, comment any way you disagree with what I have to say. Oh, wait, let me finish my final, final comment tonight at 8 PM Eastern standard time. I will live stream again. I just wanted to get this particular live stream out of the way, but I will be live streaming tonight at, at uh, 8 o'clock. So please come back at 8 p.m. this evening um, and to, to, to hear me live stream and yap, yap, yap. Um, and if you like what you heard, please press like and comment. Comment any way you disagree with what I have to say. We'll have a conversation. Feel free to... Uh, to um, Share any content uh, on this channel. As a um, as a first amendment absolutist, it's my duty to inform you to create your own platform and utilize it because we are in fact the muckrakers of our time. Also, remember to correct of uh, it to to uh, reject corporate media, and of course, always remember that uh, that we need to uh, work for a full parting of Julian Assange. Um, fully pardon and free and pardon Ed Snowden, free Palestine, free health care for all, and free speech. Protect that, and of course, um, to you know, to to stay high too. Um, I can't wait for that to be legal in North Carolina. I can't wait. I can't wait. I want it to be legal in North Carolina so bad. So, oh, and Mark, Max, sorry, Jay, how are you doing this morning? So, um, anyway, as I said, please come on back tonight and I'll be uh, back again and I will talk to every one of y'all soon. Y'all take care. Bye bye. Trying to get everything set up. There we go.